Thank you, Richard. All right, onward with our presentations this afternoon. Our next presenter is uh, Dr. Christopher Dunn, and uh, his title is Humanity First. Imagine that. We don't hear very much of that these days, do we? Strategies for Reducing Stigmatization in the Community. You know, last it was either last year or the year before, I forget now, we had a presentation on how language and uh, the ver terminology that got used tore people down. And I think we're about to hear more about how we're going to build people up and bring about uh, some humanity in this dialogue. So I'm really looking forward to seeing the positive side of this conversation today. Uh, Dr. Dumb is an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology at Kent State. Uh, he received his PhD in criminal justice from the University of Albany in 2014. 2016 book entitled Exiled in America. I'm going to get the title of the books right today. Exiled in America, Life on the Margins in a Residential Motel. Uh, received a 2018 Scholarly Achievement Award from the North Central Sociological Association, an honorable mention in the 2017 Prose Awards, and was long listed for the 2017 An Andrew Carnegie Medal of Excellence in Nonfiction. We should have copies of that book out here for sale, too. Uh, he has published articles in Criminology and Public Policy, the Journal of Experimental Criminology, and Sexual Abuse, a Journal of Research and Treatment. So he's obviously well published, and we're looking forward to this presentation. He's also the co-founder of the ID13 Prison Literacy Project uh, based at Lake Erie Correctional Institution in Ohio. So would you please welcome Dr. Dumb to the stage? Ooh. We're on now. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. I'm really honored to be here to speak with you today. This is my first experience at an RSOL conference. Uh, so I just first want to commend you all for the work that you're doing. I know it's incredibly difficult considering the public attitudes that many people have toward registered citizens. And while I personally don't experience that stigma, I've grown quite familiar with it through my academic research. And as a scholar, my research really focuses on two things. One, trying to understand the lived experiences of registered citizens, and then two, trying to understand the public attitudes toward registered citizens. And so after conducting this research and after reading a lot of it just based in my job, it sort of all comes back to this idea, right, of humanity first and using that idea to reduce stigmatization in the community. So I got this awesome PowerPoint clicker here. Thank you for that. Uh-oh. Did it work? I just jinxed it. The, the laser pointer works, but the click thing isn't working. Oh, there we go. Just kidding. Okay, sorry, the wrong one. It says up or down, and it's not clear as to which one. So, yeah. Does anyone know what this slide refers to? What is it? Yeah, so this is from the show Battlestar Galactica. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that. Um, it's a picture of a Cylon, and which is essentially like this humanoid robot. So in the show, the problem is that everyone thinks... Um, that these Cylons are actually human, but in fact, they're these dangerous robots, right? And so that I bring this up because sort of we have this opposite problem with people on the registry, right? We're talking about human beings, but everyone just thinks they're these dangerous people walking around in the community, right? And we're here today because we believe in encountering those ideas. And like so many people have already mentioned, a lot of combating stigmatization has to come down to stories, right? So this is my first North Soul conference, but I constantly hear the theme of stories, right? Um, and people ask me sort of, you know, how did you get to study sex offenders in the community, especially when they don't know a lot about uh, registered citizens? And what it comes down to is really sort of this desire just to hear more stories from people who sort of been pushed to the margins of society. Um, and sort of this need to understand those stories is really what brought me here today. But I want to share briefly just some inspiration as to where that came from. Um, so this is a photo of NPR reporter David Isay. And what he did in 1993, this is before iPhones, he gave tape recorders to uh, two 13-year-old kids in Chicago. And basically he told them, go about your daily lives and just talk into these tape recorders and tell me what's going on. Tell me what you're experiencing in your daily lives. 
And so they used over 200 hours of audio, and they produced two NPR segments, and then this award-winning book called Our America, Life and Death on the South Side of Chicago. I highly recommend it. It's a really in-depth look at what it means to be growing up in housing projects. And so I read this book as a criminal justice student, and it, it was fascinating. It, just, it made me ask myself, like, what other stories are waiting to be heard, right? And I was aware of many of the restrictions that were placed on registered citizens at the time, and I wanted to understand more about how that affected their day-to-day -day lives. I wanted to hear about these policies. I wanted to hear stories about how that was affecting people. Because if you think about if we are assessing laws and how they're impacting people, we need to know if they're working or not. We're only going to get that information, in a sense, from the people who are actually experiencing it. So in 2012, I set out to try to find registered citizens to, citizens to talk to, to to understand their stories. And I didn't know of NARSOL at the time, so I apologize for not reaching out to any of you at that point. So what I did was I started looking on the registry to try to find people. My idea was other researchers just have sent like postcards to people on the registry saying, hey, we're doing this study. Would you like to participate? I was thinking about doing that. And what I found was so many people on the registry were listing their addresses at this one particular motel. And at that point, someone naively, I had never really considered that people would live in a motel. Like, th that just never occurred to me. Um, to me, it seemed noteworthy that so many people on the registry had to rely on this place to live in. So I set out to understand more about the experience. So I'm going to start today with a story about a place I call the Boardwalk Motel. And I'm going to warn you that this story uh, has some offensive language, so earmuffs at times. Um, and at some points, it can kind of be a little bit of a downer. Um, I'm not, but I'm not sharing that to depress you. What I'm sharing is I want you to understand that first, you're not alone in your experiences, and second, the experiences facing registered citizens can actually be quite dire, right? So I want to sort of drive home the importance of why we should focus on this. So, here, so welcome to the Boardwalk Motel. I don't know if you can see others. Oh, that screen's not working okay, so you just got to look at this one, sorry. Uh, so this is located in upstate New York, and the name of the boardwalk, it's a pseudonym, as well as all the other names of people in this study. So there's some more uh, pictures of it there. So just to give you a little bit of context, uh, the boardwalk was built in 1960 in a town I call Dutchland. And it's, see, this is, it's represented by the A up here. And it sits just along this like five-lane highway that runs through these suburbs here. So if you look at these houses, these housing developments back here, they run for like two hundred fifty dollars to $380,000. So it sort of gives you a sense of kind of the social juxtaposition of what we're talking about. And these letters, they just correspond to different points of interest, like tobacco stores or grocery stores, places that someone who is living in a motel might want to go visit or might, uh, might want to use. So this small, I don't know if anyone knows anything about motels. I didn't before this project. So the motel was built in sort of the golden era of motels in the 1960s but its reputation started to deteriorate in the 80s after it was bought by a new owner. And so a, uh, a newspaper used this to describe the office, saying obscenities are scrawled in the dust on the office windows and hand-lettered signs disclaiming liability are stapled to the wallpaper. At that same article, the owner of a motel across the street complained that the strip was simply much nicer before they bought in. The biggest problem is they don't screen the people they rent to. And then in 1996, a newspaper article referred to the motel and a bunch of other motels on that street as Desolation Row after a resident died in one of them. So to just give you some more history about this location, as early as 2002, this motel contracted with the Department of Social Services to provide housing for people who otherwise might be homeless. This included families, those with physical disabilities, as well as individuals coming out of prison, especially those with sex offense convictions. And so... In July of 2007, there was an audit, and they found that from 2005 to 2006, they'd actually placed 14 families with children at the boardwalk at the same time that registered citizens were living there, and this obviously caused this huge uproar in the community and in the news. And they also found out that biannual inspections of this motel were not taking place. So they did an immediate inspection of 24 rooms, and they found code violations in every room. And I'll let you read over this slide here just to see... Get, your, get a sense of what we're talking about here. And you can also, if, if this, yeah, that's also up there. So. So after this investigation, DSS declared that they would no longer send families with children to the motel, but they'd still send other homeless individuals there. 
And in response to concerns about this, in August 2009, the city actually passed a law that said if you're a motel under 50 units like this motel and you want to rent to registered citizens, you have to pay $1,500 a year to get a license. And they actually said that if you choose to house people in this motel, you actually can't accumulate more risk points than six. So think about like two level threes, three level twos, anything like that. You couldn't go over that mandated number. Um, so two months later after this law passed, there were 20 fewer registered citizens within the town. Within four months after this law passed, only two motels, including this one, had applied for the license. And then by 2010, this is the only motel in town that actually had this license that could rent to registered citizens. And this motel received $45 a day from DSS for each registered citizen who was housed there. So obviously, because of this, many citizens in this town were voicing concerns that they felt their children couldn't go out to play, and that they didn't feel safe. I attended one town meeting, and this elderly resident said that she thought her tax dollars shouldn't have to go for paying uh, like when police and fire departments and EMTs would respond to the motel. So, and what we see is, like, obviously, we've talked about legislation and things. So we know that essentially what necessitates the need for the motel as a housing option is all these numerous federal, state, and local laws that are designed to reduce recidivism by restricting housing options, right? And we know that research has found numerous problems with these laws, including that information on registries is incorrect, and that simply that residence restrictions just don't have any effect on recidivism. So, but despite overwhelming public policy support and sort of the best intentions of lawmakers, the research basically says these policies fail to do anything. They fail to improve public safety. And instead, criminal, excuse me, criminal, criminologists argue that these laws essentially hinder successful reentry into the community, right? That's essentially the, the end takeaway. So, but despite this, when I began my research in 2012, there really had been no studies looking at the experiences of what it was like to have to live in a situation like this. So there have been studies interviewing people and doing surveys with registered citizens about their experiences, but no one had really sort of done this in-depth examination of day-to-day -day life at this place. And that was what I was really interested in. Too. And just so, sort of for context, because this doesn't exist in a vacuum, using motels and hotels as shelter for homeless individuals is a widespread practice. Uh, if you can consider some statistics, Massachusetts spent $48 million in 2013 to house nearly 2,000 families in motels. That same year, Portland, Maine placed families in hotels for 198 nights. That's an increase of 191% from the year before. In July 2016, 4,000 homeless New York City residents slept in 46 different motels. In the previous year, the city only relied on eight locations. So we had this huge increase of people needing housing. There's a Holiday Inn Express, uh, a Holiday Inn Express in Queens, and the number of homeless people living in that is actually 30 to 40 percent of the building's capacity. So basically, to drive forward the point that a lot of people have to rely on motels and hotels for shelter because of housing instability. So not just registered citizens, but what we see is these situations, these locations, then throw registered citizens and non-registered citizens who are all experiencing homeless together, right? And that's sort of this interesting phenomenon. So I was really interested in exploring what this meant. Like, what was it like for people to live there? So in order to do this, I rented a room at this motel from June 25 to June 2013, or excuse me, 2012 to 2013. And what the purpose of this is enables me to do is to conduct an ethnography. And that's like this jargony term. But really, it's just a study of people and social groups as they go about their daily lives. So what we do is we collect data observation, we observe, and we just write down what we see as field notes. We record uh, conversations that we have with people, and that tells us, um, gives us our data. So once I got this room at this motel, I started to introduce myself to residents, telling them I was a researcher. I was interested in, in speaking to them about their experiences at the motel. And just to be clear, no one was compensated in any way to speak to me. Uh, people weren't forced to speak with me. And really what I found was overall, many people were really just interested in sharing their stories, right? Going back to this idea of telling stories about who we are and what we're experiencing. Now, I should also mention that um, while I had a room at the motel, I also had like an apartment at the time. I was living with my girlfriend, too, and I had a campus job. So it's not like I upended my whole life and just moved into this motel. Um, but basically, I rented, I, I, the reason I spent a year maintaining a room was so I could go and spend time there um, and really just sort of observe things and get the best picture that I could of the motel. And what it comes down to, really, is the story of the motel is really a story of dealing with stigma, right? Uh, these are quotes from motel residents they are not registered citizens, um, but they really capture how people labeled the boardwalk. So this first quote is from Roy, and he's saying, we're talking, he said, most of the people, most of the women here are on what? Drugs. 
drugs, and most of the men are pedophiles, right? Why would a person in their right mind want to live here? You're either a druggie or a pedophile, right? So we see this stigmatization going on. Second quote is from Sam. He says, all they know is this is a pedophile hotel. Everyone sitting out here is a pedophile. That's all they know. Everyone knows about the boardwalk, you know, because they had to find someone to put these pedophiles. That's news to Ms. Johnson. She's sitting at home watching TV. She doesn't want these motherfuckers close to her kids. They ship them way up here. That's from Sam, and this is, uh, the third quote is from Jake, who's telling me about an experience he had with people driving by, and he said, these two fucking assholes in a fucking car rolled by called me a fucking pedophile. So and this is sort of a common, a common occurrence at the motel, people driving by and, and doing this, because we'd hang out in the parking lot a lot on nice days. Um, and so because this motel is housing registered and non-registered citizens, it creates a lot of, atten- a lot of tension between these two groups. Uh, one interesting thing was a lot of motel residents were sort of perturbed by the fact that they thought registered citizens were actually rewarded with this free room at the expense of DSS, while other people, like the working poor, were paying for their rooms um, out of their own pocket. And so this resentment, just sort of coupled with antagonism in general, created like this situation where registered citizens sort of were fearing that violence could erupt at any time. Um, so Daryl was paroled, and he came to the motel in 2012, and DSS's goal was to move him into a cheaper place as soon as possible. So they wanted him to find an apartment for about 350 a month, uh, but this is like impossible because only 7% of rental units in that area could be found for like 399 or cheaper. Uh, so in January 2013, his PO moved into another motel, and he hated this because he had to share a room with other people. And he told me, "I'm not good with this. You know, I'm not good with living with other people. I freak out." Uh, so he and his partner, they hoped uh, to get an apartment together, but obviously DSS and parole had to approve his move. So he did move, actually, at the end of 2013, or excuse me, the beginning of 2013, January 2013. He got approved to move into a boarding house, this 12-room boarding house. Um, it was an hour and a half bus ride from downtown. It was like the end of this really like bumpy dirt road. And when I got there to visit him, he told me, this is like Slum City, and on each of my visits, these same two guys would be sitting in the living room, like huddled under this blanket, watching TV with the lights off. Um, there was one working bathroom, one working shower in the shared kitchen, and it was so cold the guys would turn on the oven to like 450 and just open the oven, and that's like how they would try to heat their house. Um, bathroom is just full of murky water and just like expired air fresheners all over the floor. Not a very nice, inviting place to live. Um, so he's trying to get out of there as soon as he can. In April 2013, he found out that a park was being constructed near the building and he can't live within 1,000 feet of the park, so he's got to move again. Um, so he and his partner found a house in a nearby city. I helped them move. Uh, this sort of unassuming two-story white building, pretty nice. They felt good about the apartment. Uh, they wanted to do, uh, they were really looking forward to like sprucing it up and decorating it. Then less than a month later, Parole informed him that he couldn't live there because there's a daycare within 1,000 feet. And he was like, well, when I moved here originally, the police didn't say anything about that. And the department essentially was overruled by a state law um, that overruled anything on the local level. So again, he had to go move. Came up with a list of 10 apartments, uh, of which they had to bring to POs. And then only four of those were approved. So I was actually out of town when they moved. But Daryl told me moving was a crazy day. We were supposed to move to a two-bedroom. The day we were supposed to move, the landlord canceled on us. He rented it to somebody else. So we ran around all day finding a different apartment and moved in the evening. And they called it a desperate move because each address had to be given to the PO and then checked out in a period of just a few hours. The apartment they ended up taking was the only one that parole approved. They showed up at 7 p.m. with a truckload of their stuff, just praying that the landlord would let them live there, which he did. So, and I mentioned sort of this resilience, right, required to deal with life as a registered citizen. I think this is an example of the things that people have to contend to, and I commend Daryl for um, going, through, going through this chaotic experience. And I know so these lives, these stories I've shared with you this may seem a little depressing, and I'm, I'm sorry, um, but really they're sort of they're the end result of all the social stigma that exists in society. Um, and no stigma is a term that we've heard before. We use it a lot. Um, But what I want to do now is sort of focus on this concept of stigma and sort of the storytelling of how it unfolds. Because if we're going to fight it, we really need to have a really good definition and understanding of what's actually going on during that process. So there are a few ways to define stigma. So according to Merriam-Webster, it's just a mark of shame or discredit. Um, In the academic world, sociologist Irving Goffman has this definition of an attribute that's deeply discrediting. Um, So this is sort of one of the most often cited um, definitions. 
But what we need to remember, and Irving Goffman actually says this in his work, is that stigma, when we talk about stigma, we should be talking about a language of relationships and not just attributes. So what this requires us to do is think about not stigma itself, but stigmatization, which is a process that unfolds between the relationships between people. So there are two sociologists, Joe, uh, Joe Phelan and Bruce Link, and they have this really interesting way of conceptualizing the stigmatizing process. And so what they view stigma as is stigmatization occurs when elements of labeling, stereotyping, separation, status loss, and discrimination co-occur in a power situation that allows the components of stigma to unfold. So what does that actually mean? Like, what does that look like? So I was, tell, I was telling my friend earlier that PowerPoint has these things where they allow you to like, it basically design slides for you. So don't blame me if you don't like these designs here. Um, so the first thing that happens, right, in stigmatization is this distinguishing and labeling of differences. And obviously, right, human beings are different from each other in many ways. We have different hair, clothes, nose. Um, some of us, like me, are really short, right? So, but most of these differences are of very little social consequence. But as long as we have a criminal justice system, there's always going to be a difference between those who are involved in the system and those aren't, right? But we also have to recognize that society has created a particular label for people convicted of sex offenses, right? Choosing them to label sex, then sex offenders, sexually violent predators, et cetera, right? So the story begins with a choice by policymakers to focus on this particular difference, right? And we note that we don't have this difference for someone, say, convicted of, like, carjacking or burglary, right? So we make a conscious choice to make this distinction between people with this offense. Component two, stigmatization involves associating these human differences with negative attributes, right? So we take these differences and then we link them to stereotypes. So we see this incurring in context outside of the justice system, right? We see um, stereotypes that associate people's skin color with their work ethic, right? Which is just as BS as saying that someone with a sex offense conviction is always going to be a pedophile, right? So, but we have sort of these stereotypes about people. I'm sort of a nerd, so we basically think that all sex offenders are these, you know, dangerous Mr. Smith clones, like, walking around, right? So we have this clear association between the difference and the stereotype. And sorry that these tables are a little small, but academic research really shows us the scope of these stereotypes. So this is by an article by Fortney and others. And what it's doing is it's examining perceptions of sex offenders versus reality. And we can see, so on this left column, basically we have survey questions like what percent of sexual assaults of adults do you believe are committed by strangers? We have the actual factual number, right, 25% or 27%. And then we have what the public thinks, 49%, right? So it's showing the discrepancies between fact and what the public believes, right? We see that the public is also overestimating reoffense rates, right? So we have this survey question, what percent of child molesters do you believe reoffend in a sexual manner? Published data, 13%. The public says 76%, right? So just huge discrepancies in what people think versus reality. The interesting thing about the study is that it actually also interviewed registered citizens about their opinions. And we find that in some instances, like stranger danger and things like that, the, offense, the offenders' beliefs are actually more aligned with the data. But even for things like um, percent of offenders that you think are abused as children, even people on the registry have a pretty high inaccurate estimate of actual fact um, there. And this is just another table from that, just comparing the results. So basically the beliefs from people who are on the registry compared to the beliefs of people in the public. And we can see in every single instance, the public is actually overestimating compared to the people on the registry in terms of what they think is occurring. So the third thing that happens in the stigmatization process is this creation of us and them, right, the simple process of creating in-groups and out-groups. We can see this happening all over the places in contexts other than sexual offense convictions. And what happens is, and Lick and Phelan warn us of this, is when labeled persons are believed to be distinctly different, stereotyping can be smoothly accomplished because there's little harm in contributing all manner of bad characteristics to them. So in the, in the extreme, the stigmatized person is basically thought as to be so different from us that they can't actually be human. Right? And then in that extreme, all manner of treatment becomes possible against that person. Right? And what we see in society right, is 
them become something to be feared, right, where there's apps you can download to find them and you warn your kids about them. And we sadly have seen cases of vigilante justice, right, um, people thinking that people on the sex offense registry are not deserving of compassion and more deserving of anger and violence and hatred, right? So the fourth component of stigmatization involves status loss and discrimination. So stigmatized groups are disadvantaged when it, be, when it comes to a general profile. This is all stigmatized groups are disadvantaged when it comes to a general profile of life chances like income, education, psychological well-being, housing status, medical treatment, and health. We can see this, obviously, probably in your own lives. And as a result, stigmatized persons may avoid potentially threatening contact altogether, right? So this results in strange and uncomfortable social interactions with potential stigmatizers. You saw that at the motel. More constricted social networks. I'm sure you've experienced this. A compromised quality of life, low self-esteem, depressive symptoms, right? We had a workshop here talking about self-care and how to deal with feelings um, that's come from being on the registry, unemployment, income loss. So um, one example, uh, an example from uh, the findings of Rolf, uh, Sean Rolf, who's actually here, um, did a study of homeless shelters, surveying 50 homeless shelters, or excuse me, 57 homeless shelters for single men, and finding that only 16 accept registered citizens, right? So 71% did not. So a classic example of status loss discrimination, so how this stigma is affecting people, exacerbating housing instability. We can see this is a study uh, by Richard Tewksbury. Um, he published in 2005. He's surveying 121 registrants in Kentucky. And we're seeing this number of them, almost 50% are suffering from loss of job, almost a quarter denial of place to work, 45% loss of place to live, 54% um, loss to friend he found out about registration. So we can see these collateral consequences of being on the registry um, unfolding. This is a study from Jill Levison, whose name has been mentioned a lot. It shows the experiences of 109 registrants in Florida. And what we see, it's, sorry, this is so small. My apologies. But like 66% are suffering financially from residence restrictions. 73% suffering emotionally. 57% say they have to live further from unemployment opportunities. So basically just documenting the huge litany of the cascade sort of negative consequences that people experience from being on the registry, right? Being subject to laws that, as I said earlier, that we know don't work. And sort of to drive this point home of sort of this cascade of effects, I want to go back really quickly to the boardwalk motel. So this is a picture of, this is a room I rented. Um, there's a water leak, and water was just like pouring in from under the shower. Over here, you can see it on the floor. So I was gone for a few days for a conference. I came back in, and it smelled like something had died. Um, the bathroom was just covered in water, and there was water all over the place that had begun to seek into the carpet in the living area. And the maintenance people took the toilet off the pipe to try to figure out what was wrong, um, and eventually stopped. But So I want to watch you do just like think, remember those code violations that I listed before, right? That seemed really appealing and awesome. Um, just sort of think about what those conditions and the messages that sense to people who have to live there, right? This motel, if you were paying out of pocket to live in this motel, you'd be spending $820 a month. And these rooms don't guarantee heat, they don't guarantee air conditioning, a kitchen, a phone, smoke detectors, drinkable water, right? So people would tell me on several occasions, like, nobody here gives a shit, which implicitly says nobody here gives a shit about us, right, if you read between the lines. Other people would tell me, like, people can't live like this, they just can't live like this. But then I would talk to the day manager, Elizabeth, who would say, you're only getting guys from social services. They don't give a shit. So recognizing this sort of status loss situation, a lot of residents at the motel actually fantasized about shutting it down. Uh, so Jake told me that he wanted to report the living conditions to people, but he worried about, like, he worried what would happen to people. And he told me, I just can't, like, fucking call the goddamn powers that be, because then fucking everybody here would be homeless, and I'd feel like a dirtbag. And then another resident told me that even if things were horrible, it would take some sort of accident to change things. And he said, if somebody got hurt and they had reported code violations, there would be a problem. It's going to take everybody getting seriously hurt or injured, then everyone's going to be in the bandwagon. And he got really quiet. And he was like, it's just really sad. And it turns out that he was right. So in December 2013, a resident fell through the floor of this motel. And this prompted an inspection by the town attorney, and they uncovered over $500,000 worth of code violations such as those seen here and here. 
And so the town acted really quickly. They filed a case with the state Supreme Court. They decided that on January 23rd, 2013, at 4 p.m., the motel would be shut down and everybody would have to leave. And so the owner started to begin all these unsanctioned repairs on the motel to keep it open. A bunch of residents left to find new housing. But there was sort of this belief among people working there, people living there, that nothing would happen, right? They had sort of been in this situation before. So the morning of January 23rd brought a really unpleasant surprise for the nine people who are still living there. The wind chill, when I look back at this, um, you can find this is really interesting. The wind chill that day was around negative five, and wind gusts were recorded as high as 30 miles an hour. So news trucks arrived from local news stations, along with local law enforcement. They knocked on people's doors and said, at 4 p.m., you're going to have to be out of here. This caught residents off guard because they were unaware that the motel would actually be closing that day. One had, like, literally paid rent the day before. And so the town had put signs up on the doors saying that the motel would be rendered uninhabitable, uninhabitable, but someone tore them down and no one saw them. So the rumor was that the owner instructed the desk workers to do that. So around 2 p.m., reporters show up, town representatives show up, they knock on the door telling everyone to leave. And then the town levels $500,000 in fines, 600 code violations, and they make an offer to the owner. They say, we'll drop all these charges into the fines if you just get rid of this damn thing. And then so in March 2015, he agreed, and in summer of 2016, they demolished this motel. So after of talking to people about this, residents were really perplexed that this motel stayed open as long as it did. Um, if you think about the code violations in 2013, really not much worse from what I showed you existed back in 2007. Some assumed that the only way it stayed open was because the owner paid off inspectors, after the boardwalk was shut down, it was actually revealed that in 2013, an August inspection by DSS was faked, and then DSS claimed that although they had the power to conduct inspections of rooms, they didn't have the authority to do actual code enforcement at the, any of the places that they had people in. So what we see here is this classic failure by those in power to protect people without it, right? And we can count registered citizens, unfortunately, as among that group. And this is sort of the key thing we need to, so now we're going to try to get a little happier right now. This is sort of the key thing we need to remember if we want to fight stigma, right? Stigma is entirely dependent on social, economic, and political power. It takes some sort of power and agency to stigmatize. And so in order to understand the importance of power and stigmatization of registered citizens, we need to recognize that people who stigmatize have the power to accomplish a few different things, right? So people who stigmatize, they have the power to do the following, right? They have the power to ensure that human difference they recognize and label is broadly identified in, in culture, right? They can disseminate that truth very easily, right? And unfortunately, sort of with the advent of social media and 24-hour news, this happens really easily, right? People who have the power to stigmatize also can ensure that culture recognizes and deeply accepts stereotypes that they connect to label differences, right? And this, we can see examples of this every Halloween, right? When they send out lists, we talked about this earlier, lists of registered sex offenders in the area, things like that, right? So this perpetuation of myth and stereotype is occurring, right? People who have the power to stigmatize have the power to separate us from them and have the designation stick. We see this, obviously, right? We see... We, People in power have just made the decision that gives them the ability to create laws that label certain people, that label people sexually violent predators, that allow people to civilly commit people, right? So there's a power dynamic going on there. And finally, people with the power to stigmatize have the power to control access to major life domains like educational institutions, jobs, housing, and health care in ways that really put consequential teeth into the distinctions they draw. And unfortunately... I talk some other times, uh, do other talks about, about prison reentry, and I say, you know, it's, it, in some ways it's really exciting because we as people have the power to accept people coming out from prison into our lives, right? Some of us may rent, some of us may have companies or things like that, so we have the power to make sure that those opportunities are open to other people. But unfortunately, that means that anyone else who does those things has the power to stigmatize and prevent people from doing that, right? So if we think about stigmatization, we think about the power dynamics, this is what is required in order to stigmatize. And unfortunately, as you can see here, some of it is relatively easy to do. All right, so, okay, well, like, what can we do about this? This is sort of the, the title of the presentation. So Lincoln Phelan started to have this idea that we need to consider two principles, right? Whatever approach we take to reducing stigmatization has to be multifaceted and, and multi-level, right? It's going to take a lot of different things um, happening in a lot of different areas, right? We need to address the multiple mechanisms that lead to disadvantaged outcomes, and we have to be multi-level because there are different issues of individual discrimination, 
as well as structural discrimination. And whatever approach we use, right, it has to really change the deeply held beliefs of powerful groups. It has to change these beliefs that lead to stereotyping and slabeling and setting apart. Or it must change the circumstances so as to limit the power of those groups to make their cognitions the dominant ones. Right? So we either have to take these groups, the people in power, and change how they think. Or if we can't do that, we need to limit the power that they have to make those thoughts the dominant narrative in society. So final nerd slide here. It's going to take a lot of different ideas using people with different strengths and abilities, so sort of like the Avenger thing. And the best part really actually about what I'm going to say is that a lot of this is actually already going on in Narsal, which is really exciting. I actually had to modify this a little bit the other day because, as I said, this is my first Narsal conference, and I saw the stuff, and I was like, oh, wow, I'm just reading through your brochures, and this is like already stuff that's going on here. So I just want to say, like, please don't give up hope. Right? You're, on the, you're on the right track. Right, so the, just first, like, the idea, right, replacing myth with fact whenever possible. Right? Even residents of the motel knew that these myths were incorrect. Right? So this is Jake, and he's saying, that's one thing you've got to realize in your book, too. Just because somebody's a sex offender doesn't make him a fucking child molester. It just means they fucking committed a sex crime, which is essentially the most clear definition we could have, right? What is, it? What is a sex offender? Oh, it just means you committed... That's, that's all it is. It's, that's, that's what it is. So, um, so yeah. So, we, one, focusing on, on empirical research, right? We need, we need facts. Um, we need to demand the use of those facts whenever possible in news reporting about Narso-related issues. When we see these in everyday life, um, actually... <laughs> Um, the other day I was talking to someone um, about this conference I was going to, and they were like, oh, yeah, well, that's so important because you're like the really high recidivism rates. And I'm like, well, actually, you know, it's, when you consider it, it's, it's not, right? So we need to be brave enough to sort of call people out whenever that um, situation arises. And really, obviously, going beyond ourselves, someone mentioned earlier that sort of we're kind of preaching to the choir in a sense, right? So we need to make sure those, these messages and, um, and sort of and that activity goes outside of the choir. However... I will say that there are challenges to confronting myths simply because the public is actually really resistant to scientific research regarding sex crimes. Um, so this is a table from a study that some colleagues and I ran, and I'm going to try to distill this down into non-boring stuff. So basically what we did is we randomly signed people to read a text vignette, and basically what that vignette did was vary the information that a person received about resistance restrictions as well as the source of information. So basically, the person who was taking our survey would get a vignette that would either tell them how residence restrictions create collateral consequences, or the vignette would tell them um, that they don't work, that they don't reduce crime. Right? So either they see that they don't work, or they see that they do bad things to people on the registry. And then we also did, too, is we modify who's giving that message. So in one scenario, they're getting that from like a sheriff, and then the other, they're reading like a, new, uh, like a, a, a report from... Um, like, a, like someone like me, like an academic person. And unfortunately, what we found is that regardless of the message and regardless of the messenger, it doesn't really matter. So this is the support for residence restrictions, and these are all the different... There's four different conditions. You can see there's basically no difference in those. So people just don't really seem to be too moved by these... Um, these things. So we need to really sort of be aware that, in, this, in a sense, there's a public resistance to scientific fact regarding sex offense convictions just because of the emotion tied to this. And in a way, I think we should be aware sort of of the growing resistance to scientific fact in this country as a whole. And I think we can see this as sort of in skepticism of climate change and GMOs and vaccinations and things like that. So part of this idea of challenging myths is really to try to move this country towards back towards a country where people are actually accepting of scientific evidence, right? If our society is one that believes in science and scientific fact and evidence, instead of sensationalism and emotion, right, that sets the stage better for an organization like NARSOL to succeed. And step two, sort of this, right, humanity first idea, and this is really the key, right, is humanization Humanity first, right? We realize that stigmatization creates us versus them. The goal of stigmatization is to make the them seem not human, right? So we need to sort of, how do we boost that back? And thankfully, this is something we've seen emphasized over and over in this, in this conference, is sort of the, this idea of humanity and humanizing. One thing we talk about is person-first language, right? 
So this is a table uh, from a study by Harris and Socia. It looks about the language used to talk about sex crimes. So basically, they surveyed people, and they gave them samples um, of, different, uh, excuse me, of different policies. So basically, they would say um, the identity of all people who have been convicted of sexual... Oh, the identity of all people who have committed crimes of a sexual nature should be made available to the general public on the Internet. Or you would see the identity of all sex offenders should be made available to the general public on the internet, right? So basically, one group sees things with very person-first language. The other sees the stereotypical sex offender language. And what we find is that people who see the person-first language have less support for these policies, right? So by using person-first language, we can decrease support for policies that restrict people with sex offense convictions. So right, just a clear example of how this can be effective, right? So you'll notice I'm using the term registered citizen. You probably do that in your own lives as well, right? Just to give you some hope that this is not a sort of something that we just throw to the wind and pray works. Studies show that this actually does change people's attitudes, right? So we should keep doing this and keep focusing on it and ensure that other people do this as well. And so this is just an, uh, the final table um, for this. And we can, what we're seeing is that there are differences between Experimental conditions and the control conditions. So the experimental condition is always a higher number, meaning that those who saw that, meaning who saw the sex offender language, are always more supportive of these policies. So basically, focus on person-first language. It does really make a difference in people's attitudes. And another thing we can focus on to reduce stigmatization is understanding the relationship between people's attitudes and contact and familiarity. So uh, we do a lot of research about attitudes that predict, or about effect, um, excuse me, factors that predict attitudes towards certain groups. There are a lot of demographic factors that predict attitudes towards ex-offenders. Sort of the most common predictors of increased acceptance are being liberal and having a higher education. Um, but also one of the most consistent predictors of acceptance towards sex offenders is if you've had personal contact with somebody in prison or outside prison. So therefore, right, if you want to change public attitudes towards stigmatized groups, then we need to ask how, we can, how can we possibly somehow facilitate interpersonal contact in order to increase empathy and decrease negative feelings, right? And obviously, if we could get registered citizens and members of the public to have more face-to-face -face interpersonal contact, that would be great. Right? Um, but we can all understand that there might be some barriers to that. So what else can we do? And in a way, so you're already doing this, whether you realize it or not. Um, when we talk about sharing stories, right, um, we pick up the, the digest here. Right? There are stories that people are sharing about their experiences. This is actually a concept called narrative humanization. And it's basically exactly what it sounds like. It's using first-person narratives in different ways to humanize the narrator. So this is a study by Harper et al. And what they did is they had people take an attitudes towards sex offenders survey. And then they had to watch one of two videos, and then they took the survey again. And so one video, one group saw an informative piece about registered citizens, so sort of just like a, a news story, or could have even been um, a piece about like, someone like me, like an expert talking about um, the issues. And then another group featured a registered citizen talking about themselves. And what they found was, both presentations reduced the amount of stigma that the watcher applied to the registered citizen, but the stigma dropped much. So this is the before, right, for each group. Before score on stigma for the narrative video and for the informative video. We see a reduction for both, right? This is the after score. But we see a much bigger reduction when people see the narrative video, right? So there's something powerful going on in this first person Example. So I think someone asked the other day, sort of, you know, are these stories working? Yes, we have research that demonstrates that these stories, this narrative humanization, does have power. And scholars call these sort of these stories redemption scripts, and they can really be very powerful for both the person telling them as well as the people in the public, right? So the stories we tell about ourselves can be powerful tools to help reform our lives, to help us think about how we shape our past behavior, our present behavior, our future behavior. So I hope this encourages you to keep forging ahead with this type of storytelling. It can have an impact on other people, and this um, research demonstrates that. But, and I think we also need to think that maybe it doesn't always just have to be your story, right? There are other ways that we can present humanizing information about people. So this is just, uh, I want to talk briefly about a study uh, that I'm wrapping up. It has to do with the, uh, the writing project I run. So this, the data for the study I'm going to tell you about um, comes from an internet survey of adults in the United States. 
We've got 450 surveys from whites, blacks, Hispanics, and Asians. So we have a really sort of diverse sample of people that we're trying to get information from. And sort of what we're, gosh, this is so bright, sorry. So what we do is we give, we randomly assign someone to read a vignette, one of five vignettes. So one vignette they get is a news story from CBS that's highlighting high recidivism rates. And this is just of, of uh, prisoners in general. But you, you, so this news story sort of represents the most like sensationalistic thing you might encounter. Um, and then we have a research brief. So they read like a one paragraph summary of a research brief, basically discussing the needs of, of people coming out of prison, saying this is what reentry requires, this is what people coming out of prison need. They could, the, um, another group gets a news story from Huffington Post talking about reentry programs and actually talks about, res um, talks about um, ex offenders helping each other come out of prison. So it's a little more, um, I guess, a feel good story in a way. And then another group just gets. Um, set of two poems written by incarcerated writers about growing up. And then the last group gets two poems about prison life by incarcerated writers. So we tried to have sort of this gamut of information that people might encounter about people in prison. And then after we give them their vignette, they're asked a series of questions regarding their perceptions of currently and formerly incarcerated people. We ask them to how strongly they agree with this scale. So assessing that are people incarcerated dangerous, dishonest, would they avoid associating people? Would they be concerned if someone, um, if one of their neighbors was incarcerated? So this scale is designed to measure people's level of sigma that they feel towards people being incarcerated. Then they also fill out this scale, which measures their support for different reentry initiatives. So we say, okay, how strongly would you agree with this statement? You know, it's a good idea to help people coming out of prison. Uh, we should have programs and services. People can benefit from services. We should raise taxes even to improve services for people coming out of prison. Um, people coming out of prison deserve as much help as other people. And so what we find is that basically the only thing that affects people's stigmatizations, this is a really complex table, sorry. The only thing that affects people's stigma scale, really, is if you read poetry or not. That reduces the stigma that you feel towards people who are incarcerated. It doesn't, if you got the most sensationalized news story versus that touchy-feely Huffington Post thing, there's no difference in the stigma that you felt towards people. But if you got that Huffington Post story and a poem, if you, read that, if you happen to read that poem, the stigmatization you feel drops. And there are other things that also, um, unfortunately, this shows that Asians in the sample, actually, if you were Asian, you had a higher likelihood of stigmatizing people. So obviously it doesn't hold true for me, but like in general... Age is also a predictor, too. The, young, the older you were, the less stigma you felt towards people. If you had a college education, the less stigma you felt towards people. And also, we should mention that this controls for if they knew an offender. So even if they knew someone in prison, regardless of if they knew someone in prison or not, the poems are still making an effect. So the poems, in a sense, are actually sort of having a very similar effect to knowing someone in prison. So we're increasing familiarity somehow, right? And then, so this is showing um, what affects reentry support, again, the only thing that matters, the only thing that's affecting people's reentry support is whether they read poems or not. If you read poems versus anything else, your support for reentry policies is going up. And also we can see other things as well. And so really what, what's going on here is this next slide will show. So this is, um, sorry. This is, um, there's a lot of numbers here, so sorry. Basically this slide is showing what affects reentry support. So we're looking at what makes people support reentry policies more, and we throw in stigma as a variable. So what we see is the less stigma you feel towards people, the more support you have for reentry. And so if we want people to support policies, to change the policy for registered citizens, we need to affect the stigma thing first, right? That, that's the only way it's going to happen, right? People aren't going to care about these policies if they don't care about the people that the policies affect. They're not going to care about that if they don't see those people as human beings, right? So that's driving this home. But sort of the thing I want to emphasize here is that we're, we're just having people read frickin' poems, right? So you don't maybe necessarily have to tell your stories, right? Maybe there's other things that we can do that we can involve people in that show their humanity, right? That create some sort of positive identity, positive association, right? That maybe doesn't have to be exactly um, sharing your story. So I just sort of want to leave you with this, like, three goals of reducing humanization, or sorry, excuse me, three goals of increasing humanization, right? So one, oh my gosh, blah, that's, okay, yeah, okay. So increasing opportunities for registered citizens to present narratives, to present humanizing narratives about their experiences, right? I've shown you the research that shows that that does work, 
right? So we need to focus on increasing those opportunities. Two, increase opportunities for registered citizens to engage in narrative humanization that focuses on positive identities, right? Something like poetry or art or things like that that necessarily don't focus on story, but focus sort of on the human aspect of things. And then finally, right, how do we connect with allies to potentially increase interpersonal contact and humanization in the public eye, right? We can't do this ourselves. Obviously, we're going to need to, to branch out to find people who might um, be willing to advocate um, for us and with us. We recently uh, did a study. So I don't have people heard of COSA at all? So it goes support and accountability, right, with Mennonite. Um, so we recently did, did a study asking what different religious congregations might be more interested in helping people come out um, of prison with uh, sex offense convictions, and we found that essentially Catholics were like the most restrictive, non-accepting, uh, but Protestants are very accepting, older congregations are accepting, congregations made up of people who don't have children at home, which might seem sort of obvious. But so there, there are people out there, right? There are ways to identify potential groups of allies who might be more conducive to helping uh, spread the message. So finally, just to finish, right, the theme of this conference is reaching the stars. Um, Anyone who knows anything about rockets, or even if you know zero about them, you probably realize it takes a lot of power to launch something right from the Earth into orbit. So, and I mentioned earlier that stigmatization is dependent on power, dependent on people with the power to stigmatize. Um, and sort of thinking back to the motel, one of my biggest regrets was that I wasn't able to bring that community together to change their circumstances. Right, a lot of them cared about what was happening to them; they wanted things to be different but they lacked what you have in this room, which is sort of this strategy, this vision, and ability, right? So I just want to leave you with this feeling of there's a lot to be excited about. There's a lot to be thankful for, right? What you're doing gives people hope. You have power, right? It may seem really daunting to think about people in power creating laws and spreading myths and stuff like that, but you know what? You can use fact to fight fiction, right? We can stand against laws. There are workshops here about using your power to create new legislation, to fight against legislation, to create support groups for each other, right? to heal yourselves, to think about restoring balance. So there are all these things that you as a person can do to show the world that, yes, people here are people. They deserve the dignity. They deserve respect and civil rights. So thank you so much for your attention. I appreciate it. Are you doing questions at all? Oh, OK. Questions? I'll go this way. No, no, I was gone by then. Actually, I was surprised though. There's a lot. There's a lot of weird stuff in uh, in that place. You want to hold it? I'm like surprised it actually didn't happen earlier. You know, okay. just, a, just like that. Yep. Okay. Um, mine's really not a question so much as um, talking about stigmatisms. For years, we have donated to Salvation Army and Red Cross. There's been so many tragedies and disasters all over the country, hmm. and they normally create shelters for people who are put out of their homes, etc. And I recently found out that they turn away registered citizens. Hmm. So I no longer donate to them and I'm going to write a letter to them and tell them why. Mm. They're supposed to be, especially Salvation Army, a Christian organization, and to do something like this is just, to me, tragic. Mm -hmm. And I think they need, they, of all people, need to know about stigmatism and stopping that um, when it comes to registered citizens because, like you say, we're all human beings. And you actually, you bring up this really, uh, really good, interesting idea that, I mean, I've only been, this is my first in our so I have no idea what people's sort of plans are. Um, but it would be interesting to sort of think about the impact that NARSL could have or sort of if, if NARSL became more involved with supporting other causes, perhaps, like saying, okay, NARSL is donated to this thing or this like food pantry. I know you've got, you need to put your resources other places, like in grassroots, I understand that as well. But maybe just sort of somehow bring bridge gaps in a way by saying, okay, this organization is also getting, you know, is supporting other things that might be sort of, you know, when we talk sort of about this positive spin on identity and things like that to yeah. see, hey, okay, I like there's this thing. That, you know, one of the things I would like to put in my letter is that I will now send what I normally donated to them, to NARSOL, 
to try to change some of the feelings about people. Mm -hmm. We should yeah. all do that. We yeah. should all do that. Susan Walker from Denver. Um, we also have a Salvation Army, uh, it's called Crossroads Shelter in Denver. And uh, they do accept people who have committed a sexual offense uh, into the shelter. And I think one way that that got started, which is something we might be able to maneuver some other Salvation Army shelters into doing, is that uh, the, the parole and probation departments utilize both the Denver Rescue Mission and the Salvation Army Crossroads Shelter to house certain numbers of parole and probation folks uh, in their shelter, and they get paid for that. Hmm. So um, I'm not sure if that's the reason why. Uh, I know that Crossroads has taken uh, our, our folks for many, many years. Uh, and so I'm not sure if that's the reason why. But I do know that they've had that longstanding relationship uh, with both of those shelters. So. Hmm. Uh, Pat from Arizona. Um, thank you for doing all these studies. I, thought, I didn't do all of them. Well, I did like two. So, well, but I just had to read all the of them. The studies that you've done. <laughs> and I'm interested in knowing, um, as I um, meet with my legislators, is if there's a particular study that you would suggest that I give to them. Um, there... There's an issue in criminology, uh, criminology and public policy is one of the leading journals uh, in, in the field, and they did, um, and unfortunately, you might be behind a paywall from this, so if you, if you want to talk to me afterwards and exchange emails, I can try to get you the article. There's an article that came out that's basically like, sex offense restrictions, blah, 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 are ineffective, something, 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 and they don't work, right? So what now? And that was sort of the, the, the gist of it, and that really sort of summed up sort of the, the state of the field on, on showing why... Um, these, why these, these study, or why these, um, these policies don't have any effect. Um, I mean, so there are a number of them, but I think that would be a pretty, a pretty good one. It's writ that journal is specifically designed to influence public policy, so it's written in a way that sort of, you know, provides these summaries for people. So if you'd like to talk later, then we can, I can get that. The journal's Criminology and Public Policy. Um, but unfortunately, because it's an academic journey, you might not be. You, if you were just to go do it through like your own Google, you'd have to pay like thirty bucks an article or something like that. But there are ways. Um, if you know people in academia who have access to academic journals through libraries or something like that, they could grab that article for you. You can find stuff on Google Scholar, but still, there's the connection issue of actually getting the actual PDF. Um, <laughs> There might be some copyright issues widespread like that. <laughs> I, I don't want to get in trouble for anything like that. So. Hi, but. my name is Cindy from Connecticut. Oh, sorry. Yeah, just how are you? I got it. How are you? I want to thank you for your energy after lunch. It was just oh, what was thanks. needed. Yeah, I talk with my hands a lot. I just can't, no, no. can't do anything about it. <laughs> totally necessary. Thank you. Um, you know, I listened to your presentation, and one of the things that we'll be doing, well, let me give you an example. Last year, we um, aligned with, um, we needed to veto an animal abuse registry. We didn't want the governor to sign the bill. Hmm. And so we find out, found out how to do that. And then we aligned with another organization or two, uh, ASPCA, Humane Society, and we got together to kill the bill. Okay not get it signed. And so um, the relationships we have, whether it be social justice issues, criminal unfairness, uh, you know, stop solitary confinement, all of this stuff hurts the people that we're servicing. So it really does pay for us to get behind either a good bill or a bad bill that isn't so narrow to an SO mm -hmm. topic. The other thing is that uh, we were trying to figure out what our next promotion would be, like our next event. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And along the lines of what you're saying is we're going to start listening tours. And mm. so we'll go to libraries, and instead of having any experts there, we will simply have people who are mandated to register, register sorry, mm -hmm. so that we can get up close. And if I can't find the people in our state, I'm going to ask people in the surrounding states to come in. And we can actually videotape that, do it as a, you know, so I think that's a cheap, you know, a good way for us all to go get the, you know, seek the humanity. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to thank you because it was another like Paul Dubling's presentation where it just sort of in integrated. No, I, I, I want to say thank you for, for coming up and, and sort of championing that idea. I think in, in some ways it's like, oh, that's so simple. But at the same time, I think it's great that we do that. But also, we, I think we need to be very cognizant of the fact that asking people to put themselves in that situation to talk about is, is a very vulnerable, scary thing to do. Um, and so I think when we do these things, um, it's important to also make sure that afterwards, right, that we have sort of the appropriate self-care and, and things like that and, um, in place for people to do that. But yeah, I think sort of one of the common threads, you know, and I've seen this before in some literature, right, it's just that people just don't really care about facts. They want to know stories, and I think that's sort of the most important thing. And, and obviously, things are going to start, start small, but yeah, I think just creating moments and situations where people can sort of get that dialogue, even showing documentaries and stuff to in different screenings and stuff like Untouchables or something like that, right? There, there are things that we can, we can do. Um, I mean, so, like you mentioned with technology these days, right? We can access large numbers of people and put together these really interesting things, you know, using minimal resources in a way. So yeah, I think that's, you know, it, just f sort of following that lead. Okay, yeah. I've actually got one comment and one okay. question. Yeah. Um, on one of your graphs, I noticed uh, where you compared having a, an authority figure like a police officer uh, provide the statement versus the researchers. Yeah. yeah. The, there was a consistent um, effect of the police officers having more of an impact than the researchers. <laughs> I'm a researcher myself. Okay. So <laughs> um, so one thing I've actually thought a lot about is that it may be effective for us as a group to be reaching across to the law enforcement side of things because of the resources it's requiring law enforcement taking away from other things they could be doing um, to help educate people. So that's a comment. Mm -hmm. um, the second, I, totally, I to totally agree with that. Yeah, I think the that's second important. question, um, for, for personal reasons, I've, I avoid a lot of getting into the research sometimes just to stay sane. Um, do you know if Jill Levinson or other folks you've come across in your research as, as you've been doing things have done studies on the impacts to the spouse? I think I've gotten one survey to the spouses of registered citizens, the children of registered citizens, so that we can show the innocent victims of the registry and, and start taking that approach and making that more public. Yeah, yeah. Um, really quickly, um, I think that's a, a really good idea. So and sort of people are doing this just with mass incarceration in general, right? Sort of talking about children of the mass incarceration boom and how incarceration is affecting families and, and kids specifically. You might there's, you check out studies by Lisa Sample um, and some other people in Nebraska with like support... Hey, oh, what's up? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, people, yeah, doing great stuff involving family. Do you want to plug or? <laughs> okay. Sorry, I had to plug myself a little yeah. bit. Um, that's actually my area. Uh, so that was my dissertation was the, the social impact on the family. So I've done some publications and I've worked with Lisa Sample on that. So I have a couple of publications that I can give you um, that, you know, if you want to spread that out to anybody. And I know, like, Tewksbury has some, um, some quantitative stuff, but I've done more interviews and everything as well. What's your name? Danielle Bailey. And, and like Chris was saying, a lot of the articles that we deal with in our life are behind university paywalls. Um, but please feel free to reach out to us at any point. Um, Mary Sue down at Texas Voices can get a hold of me easily. Um, you can also find me on the website. And if you ever have an article that you think is really interesting but you can't get access to it, let me know. Um, because I can, and I can, I can send it out. Like Chris said, I can't post it on the website because I might run into issues, but there's nothing saying I can't download it and email it out. So. Yeah. Thanks, Danielle. Good to see you. <laughs> okay. Good night. Right. Sweet. Thank you.